Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Dill. I'm the Senate Chair of the ACF Committee, and I want to welcome everybody. We have, uh, again, three agenda items. The first is uh, at 11, as soon as we start, is the Board of Pesticides Control, Pesticide Sales and Use Report. And uh, after we get done with that at noon, we go into a work session on LD 1075, an act to protect public lands. And as soon as that is over, we will have a briefing on LD 1407, authority of municipalities to regulate timber harvesting. So that's our agenda items for today. And we'll start with introductions and I'll start with Senator Black. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chair. Russ Black from Wilton, representing Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec, Belgrade, Mount Vernon, Vienna, and Fayette. Representative Hall. Yes, good morning. Uh, Randy Hall from uh, Wilton, District 114, representing six towns in Southern Franklin County. House Chair O'Neill. Morning, I'm Maggie O'Neill and I represent House District 15, which is in Saco. Representative Osher. Hi, I'm Lori Osher, and I represent District 123. That's the majority of Orno and includes the University of Maine. Senator Maxman. Hi, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is Lincoln County and the towns of Washington and Windsor. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning. I'm Scott Landry. I represent District 113, the towns of Farmington and New Sharon. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bill Pluker. I represent House District 95, which is Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. Uh, Representative McRae. Yes, good morning, folks. I'm Dave McRae uh, from Fort Perryfield. I represent nine communities in the central part of Rooster County, comprising District 148. Thank you. Uh, Representative Underwood. Hi, I'm Representative Underwood uh, from Presque Isle. It's great to see everybody again, and thank you very much for, for passing unanimously LD 1944 from the committee. And it's great, uh, great to be here, and, and uh, thank you very much. Have a great day, folks. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's everybody that's on at the moment. Um, as usual, there's other committee members, uh, committee meetings going on. Some are folks that are on those committees. Some have bills to present, uh, et cetera. So people will be in and out. And uh, so then we'll get going. As I mentioned, I'm Jim Dill. I represent Senate District Number 5, Northern Penobscot County. Our clerk is Cheryl McGowan. And the analyst, our analyst is uh, Karen Netto. And our first... Agenda item is the Board of Pesticides Control Pesticide Sales and Use Report. And I see both uh, Pam Breyer and Director Patterson are here. And I'll start with uh, Megan Patterson to kick it off to see who's doing what. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. And um, Cheryl, thank you for including our logo on your, your cover um, image there. Um, it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, and I will share my screen. So um, this is more or less an outline of what I'm going to talk about quite verbatim. So if you know anybody needs to go back and reference it or if it helps with following along, then it should be helpful there, I hope. Uh, let's see. And, and then I guess, so what I'll do is I'll give an overview of what the report contains and I'll be focusing mostly on, um, and so this is, this is a report in response to LD 524, um, which was a resolve directing the Board of Pesticides Control to research workable methods to collect pesticide sales and use records for the purpose of providing information to the public. Um, so we've, we've taken on a number of different tasks um, in the name of doing that research, um, everything from you know, really um, looking closely at data we're already collecting and some recent uh, functionality we, we've developed uh, within the BPC collecting data we currently have the authority to collect um, to you know, looking farther afield at what other states are doing. Um, and then um, also looking historically at activities the board has 
has conducted um, and even reports that we've provided to the legislature in the past. So I'll be going through all of that at a very high level. And then after I speak, um, Pam Breyer will be talking a little bit more in detail about the data that we've collected thus far through the software that we've recently developed, um, mostly focusing on data collected, um, data from 2019 that we've collected and compiled um, entirely from just commercial applicator use summary reports. Um, so it won't include sales data. Um, so that's sort of the high level. Um, I'll also be talking about sort of in general background for this um, particular topic, uh, our existing authorities, what we're able to collect under current law, both statute and regulation, um, our actions to date, um, high level summary of that, the findings that, are the, that came out of those actions. And then um, finally, I'll be uh, including some recommendations. Um, and there are kind of two pots of recommendations, recommendations from 2002, um, most of which were uh, recommendations to change statute. None of those changes were ever made. Um, and those were staff recommendations, staff, staff of the BPC. The report in which those recommendations were um, outlined is also included as a part of the material that's been provided to you. It's a, an addendum to the 21 page report that we provided. Um, and then we also have current recommendations that staff have um, compiled based on you know, the research that we've conducted recently. So uh, provisions, so LD 524 essentially had two major provisions, um, you know, I'm kind of putting them into big pots together. Um, there were sort of multiple components to each of those provisions, but um, this particular bill um, started out as uh, having to do with schools and school um, pesticide use reporting or use reporting for uh, pesticides used on school grounds, but not necessarily by the schools. Um, and then uh, that was combined with uh, LD 1599, or more or less the, uh, some sentiments from LD 1599 um, from last session. So uh, ultimately, provision number one, um, it's what I'm calling it, but the first provision in LD 524 um, requested that the board research best methods for collecting pesticide use information from K through 12 schools, private applicators, and commercial applicators. Um, the second uh, provision asked that the board research best methods for collecting information on pesticide sales in the state. Um, so we interpreted as staff to, uh, there are a couple of things here we interpreted, private applicators, we interpreted that to be inclusive of both private applicators of restricted use pesticides, but also private applicators of general use pesticides. And um, so there are two types of private applicators in the state of Maine, and those licenses are, are quite different. Um, in terms of the scope of pesticide products available for use under those types of licenses. Um, and then the second um, thing that we've um, taken uh, some degree of liberty in interpreting had to do with um, uh, sales. So we assumed that, you know, meant um, both restricted and general use. Um, so just to kind of set the stage there that that's, that's what I'll be talking about. So when we um, started this project, we wanted to look at what had been done in the past. Um, and we started initially with looking at legislative activities related to uh, sales and use reporting. Um, and you know, the legislature's had a longstanding interest in uh, sales and use reporting specifically, but also related topics of notification and drift. All of those, those ideas have been um, to some degree inextricably in intertwined um, for many decades. Um, and there is a summary of all of that um, research, all of those bills um, that have to do with those three topics uh, included as an addendum to the report. So if you're interested in that and sort of where we've come from since the 19, I believe we went back to the 1980s, maybe a little bit further um, and then kind of coming forward, um, we, we wanted to know how, what kinds of activities came out of that. And if we, we, if we knew of every report that had ever been created as a, a response to um, you know, some sort of request of, of this type. Um, so there was a report. Um, previously, the board produced reports for the legislature of uh, 1997, 1998, and 2000 pesticide sales and use data. Um, a report that was produced for the legislature in 2002 also included data from 1995 and I believe 1999, as well as some um, more informal uh, collections of data as well. Um, we've produced over time several uh, informal summaries of sales and use data. Um, those have been not necessarily compiled for the legislature's purposes, but in some cases have been reported to the legislature. And BPC currently tracks pesticide sales and, and commercial applicator use data 
um, which is submitted annually by a variety of means. And when I say variety of means, what I mean by that is paper in some instances, but also electronic and electronic in all kinds of forms, sometimes PDFs, sometimes Excel files, sometimes via email. Um, and most recently through this development of our electronic reporting system, we've had 44, I believe, out of uh, 700, 700 or so commercial applicators uh, voluntarily choose to submit their um, end of year summary report um, through that system. So, you know, I guess there, there is that method now too. Um, and in 2019, um, the board committed um, funding to the development of an electronic reporting commercial um, use summary and sales and distribution summary reporting system. Um, it's building off existing software that we have to support our, our program. Um, and in 2020, we were able to secure um, time with our developers so that they could develop that uh, functionality. In 2021, we hired um, a part-time temp to begin entering that data. And um, that person has uh, spent the majority of 2021 entering the 2019 data. And again, it, just the existing reporting that we receive and have the authority to receive, um, but has also entered the sales data um, and is now working on, and I believe has just finished 2020 data. So that kind of gives you the sort of the, the, the high level of what where we've come from, where we're going, um, or where we are right now, I guess. So. It's up to you, I guess, where we're going from here. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about our existing authorities um, because I keep referring to the reports that uh, we already receive and what we've done with that information. Um, so we have a number of different types of licenses in the state of Maine. Um, we have a couple of different types of dealer licenses. We have multiple different applicator licenses. Um, and I'll go through each of those and sort of what those those individuals or those businesses are required to report to us currently. Um, and then also to some degree, you know, that's that's basically saying to you, this is what we have authority to collect at present under current regulations and current statutory authorities. Um, so general use pesticide dealers are those businesses that sell, you know, what you might refer to as over the counter pesticides. It's going to be your big box stores or your local hardware store or, you know, maybe even a pharmacy um, that these are the products that you can buy off the shelf without a license. Um, and those are available to the general public. Um, these folks are required to annually report or these businesses are required to annually report sales to the BPC. Uh, when they wholesale pesticides to other general use pesticide dealers, but not when they retail those pesticide products to the end user, the consumer, the you and me that's uh, maybe buying a pesticide off the shelf uh, or a personal repellent off the shelf. Um, all general use pesticide dealers must report information for all companies from which pesticides were purchased. So even if they're not wholesaling product, they do have to tell us who they're buying from. And that was designed to help um, alleviate uh, any potential duplicative reporting of, of sales. The idea being that if you're collecting all of the wholesale information, you're getting a sense of all of the product that's coming into the state of Maine, um, rather than having it doubly reported again when it's sold to the end user. Um, just general pesticide use dealers uh, who wholesale products, they also have to report information for all the companies to which uh, pesticides were distributed. So they're telling us who the, retail, who their, who the retailers are that they're selling to. Um, and then they're also telling us um, annually uh, the brand names of the products that they're selling. They give us, um, if you're not familiar with EPA registration numbers, these are unique identification numbers for each product. Um, the total number of units that they sell and a unit could be anything from a gallon jug to a box of gallon jugs. But then they have to tell us also um, for each of those units how much they weigh or how much a volume they take up so that we can have a sense of the total amount of product that they're selling. Okay, there are some exemptions from this though, and those are in statute um, uh, 22, Title 22, 1471, W, Section 5, um, has a number of exemptions. These are mostly targeted toward um, that first bullet there, the household use products with no more than 3% active ingredient, um, but also pet supplies, disinfectants, um, insect repellents, um, any kind of animal repellent that's intended for indoors or outdoors, aquarium supplies, pool supplies, aerosol products, general paints, stains, and wood preservatives. Um, so not only are those re exempted from the reporting requirement, but they're also exempted from licensure. So businesses that are selling solely these types of products and are there would normally be general use pesticide dealers, they do not have to carry a license with the Board of Pesticides Control. And so do not provide us with any reporting. 
Um, and there are a number of businesses that fall into that category. Uh, there are also, are also restricted use pesticide dealers in the state of Maine. And essentially these folks, uh, these businesses are selling only those pesticides that are available for purchase or use by licensed applicators or their supervised employees. They may also sell general use pesticides, but they have um, licensure uh, appropriate to be able to sell um, these restricted use pesticides. And generally those are pesticides that have been identified either by EPA or by the Board of Pesticides Control as having some heightened level of uh, potential risk for human health or for the environment. Um, and so they have additional labeling um, indicating as much. Um, or at the state level there, it's identified in state law and state rule um, that those pesticides have uh, potential additional risk and can only be used by licensed applicators or the your use has to be supervised by a licensed applicator. Um, the folks who are selling restricted use pesticides are required to um, report um, contact information for all companies from which their pesticides were purchased. And they also have to provide us with two separate reports, depending on um, if they're selling uh, to companies and or if they're selling to uh, consumers. And so there are essentially two different reports and they may have to submit both reports to us, depending on who they typically sell to. Um, and each of those reports has to indicate, again, brand name, the EPA registration number, the total number of units sold, and the weight uh, or volume per unit. Commercial applicators. So this is a, a user type of license. So these are individuals who are applying pesticides um, as a part of a business offering. They're making applications in exchange for compensation to areas open to use by the public or possibly um, as a part of their government employment. Um, and that could be state level, it could be municipal level um, employment um, by a, a governmental agency. Um, but you know, it, it can either be an individual or it could be an entire spray contracting firm. That would be the, the, the business um, term that we would use to say there are multiple applicators working for that particular company. Um, both spray contracting firms and commercial master applicators uh, working as sole proprietors. So those are individual people who have a license and they're you know, essentially working for themselves and have no employees. If they're doing this work for compensation, applying pesticides for compensation, or in areas open to the public, they have to keep detailed records of each application that they make. Um, and those <clears throat> are recorded in either a logbook or sometimes electronically, and they include quite a number of different um, detailed elements. They also have to um, report to us annually um, the supervisory applicator's name, their license number, and the following data. So the site of application, and I know, um, you know that, that can be a confusing term. That's not specifically the address of the application. That would be the type of either crop, or it could be turf, or it could be hard, a hard surface, like a countertop, for example. Um, but it's specifically the language that's on the pesticide label that says, this product is lawful for use in this particular type of area. Um, so if you're an agricultural producer, um, then that they, it would specifically say the type of crop you might be applying this product to. Now, in this case, we're talking about folks who are doing this work for hire. So it could be, you know, a right of way, it could be um, pavement surfaces, any number of different locations, but the label has to contain that, that language for it to be a lawful use. That is what they report to us, the site, um, the pesticide brand name, again, the EPA registration number, the total amount of uh, gallons or pounds of undiluted formula, uh, and also the total area that they treated. They also have to maintain uh, log books. So as I mentioned, you know, this information uh, is something they're, uh, I'm sorry, my, let me back up. Commercial applicators do have to maintain log books, but when it comes to private applicators and private pesticide applicators of general use pesticides, so that private applicator versus ag basic applicator, these are our farmers, our foresters, our nurseries, um, greenhouse producers, cannabis producers, um, this is also if, if you happen to be an organic farmer who um, chooses to use pesticides in some manner, then you also would be in in this category of a general use pesticide dealer. If you're if you're producing a, a food, uh, a plant or plant product intended for human consumption, these folks are not required to submit annual records to the Board of Pesticides Control. They do have to maintain uh, records. Um, and those records are more of, it's a, lo a logbook, and it contains all of this information that I've outlined here. So there's 
quite a lot of content that they have to maintain for every single application that they make. Um, again, they're not required to submit that information to the Board of Pesticides Control on an annual basis, um, but they are required to keep those records on hand for two years. And that's the same requirement exists for commercial applicators. There is a little bit more to this, much like uh, when I mentioned general use pesticide dealers, I said there are people who are exempt from maintaining a license, but they still um, would have to, uh, they still may be selling pesticides. Um, the same kind of caveat pertains here, where there are agricultural producers who may choose to use pesticides, but don't necessarily need to keep, um, need to maintain a license with us. So we may not be aware uh, of them specifically, um, but they you know, would have to keep records regardless uh, uh, related to possibly the use of general use sanitizers, for example, if they're applying those in wash water for produce. Um, that's been a, an area that's been recently identified because of um, new federal regulations related to food safety. Um, but there are a number of different kinds of you know, sort of, I would argue, probably minor uses on farms that um, don't necessarily pertain to you know, broadcast applications on plant or plant products intended for human consumption. Okay, and the last um, category of, I guess, type of application that we are asked to uh, research is applications on school grounds. Um, schools themselves are not specifically licensed necessarily to apply pesticides. They do have to have an IPM coordinator on staff. That person has to be identified by the school, trained by the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, and they do have to maintain records in the form of a pest management log um, that documents all pesticide applications that are occurring on the school grounds. However, pesticide applications made on school grounds must be made under the supervision of a licensed commercial applicator and and or their employee employee um, and cannot be made just by school staff. There are some very limited exceptions to that, um, primarily pertaining to um, hand application or non powered application of sanitizers and disinfectants uh, for general cleaning purposes and also um, emergency application of ready to use uh, aerosol products for control or management of stinging insects. Um, and that's, you know, think bees, wasps, where, you know, around a doorway where, you know, um, children who, or people who may be allergic to um, bees and wasps may be traveling. Um, that, that, that is one exemption from um, that particular licensing requirement. Um, commercial applicators themselves, as we've already talked about, um, must keep records of applications made on school grounds, and those records have to be summarized and reported annually to the BPC as a part of their end of year summary reports. Um, that information, as I already mentioned, can now be submitted um, electronically by commercial applicators, uh, and I guess I'd like to add the caveat here that you know, if there was a desire to um, have school data sort of teased out from that end of your summary, um, that would be a fairly simple minor minor change to the current uh, reporting requirements or reporting, um, I guess, uh, functionality that we've built within our electronic system. Um, but it would there would be a necessary modification to board rules. Um, to require that you know, sort of delineation of applications on school grounds, school grounds being the site, there would need to be some specificity there. Okay, so actions that we've taken to date. Uh, we've done a fair amount um, related to uh, this particular report and sort of researching this topic. Um, we've reviewed existing authorities to assess the program's current ability to implement sales and use reporting. Uh, we just talked about that. Essentially, what, what I walked you through is exactly what staff um, looked at. Um, we've completed entering sales and use data for 2019, and I, I was told this morning we've, we're almost, almost done with 2020, and uh, we've completed a cursory summary of that information and patterns related to it. That's in the report. I won't be going into that in detail, but Pam Breyer will be talking about that information um, at a very high level. Um, we've issued a national survey on pesticide sales and use reporting in other states and territories, and we've received some responses back. Again, that information and the responses we receive back um, are summarized in the report. Um, we've researched sales and use reporting conducted by other states. So while not everyone responded to our survey, we did have um, make some staff effort to look at other states that we knew um, did do their own reporting um, just from you know, word of mouth and conversation about who, who's doing this right now. Um, and that I will talk about very, very briefly as well. Um, we have revisited the 2002 report um, again, which is included in, as an addendum to this report um, and looked at um, the data collection efforts and summary efforts from 1995, 97, 98, 
and actually 1999 as well and 2000. Um, and we also, in the process of compiling this report, uh, realized that while we had heard lots of sort of anecdotal sentiments, um, we had not heard directly from agricultural producers in any sort of sort of organized way. Um, so we did hold a stakeholder um, uh, information gathering session in December with agricultural producers or entities that represent those. And I know a number of um, the committee members attended uh, that particular stakeholder uh, information gathering meeting, um, but we wanted to hear what um, they thought about uh, required use reporting. Um, because of course, as we've just talked about, it's not something they're obligated to do at the moment. Okay, so all of those things that I just mentioned, activities that we've completed, um, the findings at a very high level. Um, we uh, are recently built electronic sales and use reporting functionality. Um, we identified that it likely would need to be further modified um, depending on uh, what additional data uh, the legislature would like us to uh, collect. Um, so any, you know, any additional changes there, obviously, or any, any other data, changes will need to be made. Um, and that's just, I guess, to be expected. Uh, of the compiled 2019 commercial use data, we found that there were 359 conventional pesticide active ingredients used by commercial applicators and 25 minimum risk pesticide products used. And so that's a, it's important delineation there, 359 active ingredients and 25 specific products. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of an interesting, I guess, caveat. Um, for at least for staff, from staff's perspective. Um, we conducted the national survey of other states. And uh, sort of this little listing here is a combination of both our survey results, but also uh, staff's additional research. And we identified that there are a number of states that are collecting use data in various forms, um, some really intermittently, some only occasionally when they have money to do so, some more comprehensively. So probably the more comprehensive really are California and New York. Um, everybody else is more or less doing this very, very occasionally or only, you know, a couple of categories of types of use of pesticide our data on that is collected, you know, every few years, um, depending on what uh, the state's interest is. Uh, New Hampshire and Vermont tend to collect data that's very similar to what the state of Maine is collecting currently. Um, so from our survey, we found that Arizona, Georgia, Hawaii, New Hampshire, Puerto Rico, and Washington were collecting data on, on use. Um, California, New York, New Jersey, and Vermont, we just happened to be familiar with those states and knew that they were also collecting data. This, the states that are bolded, um, those are uh, those are states that also report that data out to the public. Um, all of the others do not. They retain that information internally and do not do any external reporting. We also asked about sales data. Um, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Oklahoma responded that they do collect data on sales, only Minnesota indicated that they make that information to the public, available to the public. And we've also looked a little more closely at New York, uh, mostly because they're, they seem to be um, most similar in terms of the kind of scale, I guess, of state or size of state, um, the scale of their program for uh, commercial application of pesticide management, pesticide regulation. Um, they do collect sales and use data, um, but I think it's important to note that um, they haven't published that data since 2017, I believe was the last year that they were able to publish it. Um, we do have a little bit of preliminary information about how many staff they require um, currently. Um, most of that work is contracted through Cornell University, although they do have a number of staff members on uh, with New York DEC who also manage that process. Um, and there are some laws that, for example, protect consumer, um, customer applicator and application address data. There are no states that we could find that publish um, this kind of data and include uh, the customer information, the applicator information, or the address um, information for where those applications are made. So um, that, you know, any kind of movement in that direction would be um, something that would be novel to Maine. Um, and I think it's important to note that any changes at all um, will likely require additional staffing um, for data entry, data quality control, user assistance, and data management and reporting. Um, we also found uh, through our stakeholder meeting with growers that they have growers and um, groups representing them have significant concerns about data security, confidential business information, and so forth. Um, and I just wanted to include because I thought 
you know, the comments were fairly consistent across um, the group of folks who uh, represented agriculture. Um, again, this meeting was held on the 20th of December. Um, they had cited everything from uh, concerns about lack of time for additional record keeping or recording requirements to added pressure of the current labor shortage and its impact on existing or additional work. They talked about the difficulty of electronic reporting in the absence of reliable broadband. Uh, they talked about concerns about data use, including um, possible use of records for defamation through social media um, and or other forms of media. They indicated concerns about public access to confidential business information. And then they went on to say that the board is already collecting pesticide sales data and restricted use pesticide reach from pesticide, uh, restricted use pesticide retailers and generally use pesticide wholesalers, and that that information could provide amounts of pesticides used in agriculture in the state. And we did have, uh, I believe as nearly every major agricultural sector represented as a part of that meeting. So we're moving on to recommendations. I have just a few slides on this. And I'm going to start with the recommendations that were brought forward in 2002. And again, um, there are a number of suggested statutory changes that were never implemented at that time. Um, and I'll just caveat this also with um, staff were responding to a similar request as the one presented currently um, in that uh, there was sort of a, a request to say, what what kinds of authorities do you need to do this expansive reporting? Um, and that's where we're at to you here. Uh, it is not necessarily that we're requesting these authorities, but that we're responding to the question of, if we asked you to do this, what kinds of authorities would you need? Um, and so in 2002, it was suggested by staff that uh, the legislature consider revisions to Title 22, 1471W, that would require any person who distributes pesticides in the state to report the amount of sales, regardless of to whom those sales are made, um, so that there's just um, you know no potential um, sort of I guess lost sales uh, reporting um, or not not included entities. Um, so there was a little bit of there were a few a handful of businesses that did not appear to be included in um, the wholesale reporting, for example. We also suggested that. Uh, the legislature consider revisions to Title Seven, uh, Six of Seven, uh, to require pesticide registrants to submit additional information about pesticide products at the time of registration, and not necessarily as a part of use reporting. Um, but this is similar to something New York State does, and that use information could include um, the pounds of active ingredient per gallon of liquid formulation. That pertains to being able to report all of our use data in one one uh, essential number. So rather than for glyphosate, for example, Roundup, as you, you may know it, reporting liquid versus dry, which is how we're doing reporting right now with the current system we built, um, this would give us what they call a conversion factor, where we could report everything simply as pounds of active ingredient, rather than liquid for liquid products, dry pounds for dry products, um, we would simply be saying this is how much glyphosate was used in total in terms of poundage. Um, so that that would be a part of the, the registration data collection um, to ask uh, registrants to report on the type of pesticide. Um, and this is in a very broad sense, um, such as insecticide or herbicide, um, to give sort of a high level way to classify data. Um, to report on the probable use sector. Uh, for example, if the product is intended primarily for agriculture or turf or structures um, or industrial uses, um, that that help, might help to, uh, again, categorize data use um, areas, product use areas. Um, and then to maybe also uh, suggest inclusion of the signal word. Um, the, so the signal word on a pesticide product indicates the level of potential acute risk of using that product. Um, and that can be, you know, they're essentially just a few limited signal words, um, but that helps to kind of get at um, risk and then also potentially toxicity data. So all pesticide product labels have um, some degree of reference to toxicity, um, and that information could also be useful in terms of, you know, trying to answer questions about um, relative risk associated with use of particular products. In 2002, they also, staff also identified funding and as a, as a likely hurdle and indicated that um, funding would be necessary um, 
to support positions um, to administer uh, state pesticide sales and use information programming. Um, that recommendation still stands that funding would be necessary as would creation of new positions. Um, at the time in 2002, Cornell University had eight staff members working on the program in 2002. Um, to my knowledge, uh, not much has changed in that arena, even though um, technology has um, progressed. Um, that we consider requiring commercial agricultural producers to submit annual pesticide use reports in addition to the commercial applicator reports the board currently receives. Um, so again, uh, you know, I, I indicated to you what how agricultural producers responded to a request uh, to share their thoughts about um, use reporting. Um, it, generally speaking, uh, the sentiment coming out of that meeting was that they would not be in favor of doing so. Um, historically, the board has um, conducted informal on-farm and anonymous on-farm um, use surveys. Um, I can't tell you why that particular practice ended, but it's been a number of years since we've done so. Um, it is something that um, we could consider reviving, and I, I'm personally, professionally interested in reviving that practice of doing these anonymous surveys on-farm, um, but it would not be a mandatory use reporting requirement for private applicators. Um, we also suggested that um, the board's rules might need to be modified to require reporting by commercial pesticide applicators to tailor the reports to correspond to the types of information that is of interest to the legislature. And so this has been an ongoing, um, I guess, question among staff of, you know, what are the questions that we're trying to answer? Um, and so, you know, taking the time to really make sure we identify what types of questions we want to answer so that we can really tailor reporting to collect only those types of data that would be essential to answering those questions um, is, a, is a recommendation that was made in 2002 and is one that I believe still stands. So current recommendations. Um, we suggest modifying the commercial use summary report um, to require indication Identification of pesticide applications on school grounds, as I've already suggested. So rather than having schools necessarily report this information, commercial applicators um, could indicate um, as a part of their annual use reports uh, when the site that they're making an application at includes a school or is a school or school grounds. Um, that we should consider revisions to chapter 50 to require electronic submittal of commercial applicator annual use summary reports and restricted use uh, and general use uh, dealer annual sales summary reports. Um, requiring that electronic submittal will help alleviate the need for a staff member to hand enter all of that data, uh, which is you know, substantially how that's being done now, um, as I had previously mentioned. Uh, we'd like consideration of Title 22, 1471W to require electronic submittal of general use pesticide dealer annual sales reports. Um, and so the, the caveat here is that restricted use pesticide um, dealer reports and commercial applicator reports are both uh, required in chapter 50, whereas the general use pesticide dealer reports are required by statute. That's why we're talking about two different areas for requiring the same thing. Um, we'd also suggest, as I mentioned from 2002, you know, there was sort of a suggestion of figuring out what questions uh, we're trying to answer so we can tailor the data accordingly. Um, staff are, current staff are suggesting hosting a series of stakeholder meetings with parties that are required to submit sales and use reports and entities interested in sales and use data to better understand the types of questions um, to which the data might be applied so that we can then again tailor the types of data that we're collecting. Um, and then at present, all pesticide sales and use data collected by the board is subject to FOA. Um, so there is no way that we, we cannot protect any of the data that we collect and we cannot protect any data that we may collect in the future or be asked to collect. Um, as I mentioned, New York has some protections for uh, information related to who the applicator is, who the customer was that requested the services and the address. Um, but that's something I think you'd want to keep in mind um, if, if that is a concern um, that we consider revisions to Maine law to provide protection for information identified as CVI by agricultural producers um, and to consider the potential issues of data security for all collected information and identify ways by which um, sales and use data could be collected and protected. Um, so I think that more or less takes me to the end of what I had to talk about. Um, so I don't know if anyone has questions. Are there any questions for Director Patterson? Representative Osher. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you sharing this information with us. And uh, 
it's so important that we learn about this. I also want to thank you for talking with me a few weeks ago when we discussed, um, you know, questions. I had sent you questions and you were, um, you asked your staff to help you respond to those. I appreciate that. Uh, but I also want to say that I have been told by many people that I speak quickly and I think that you have me beat. And uh, so I appreciate that you're packing a lot of information into a small amount of time. Uh, it's essential though, that we are able to uh, have this summarized uh, so that we can make sure we can drill down. So um, there's a lot to unpack and I have specific questions, um, but, but one of my, 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 fav my first thing I wanna do is make a motion for the committee to have a bill to create a pesticide registry. Because as all of this information comes to us, it's still, the you gave us a summary that included a report from 20, 2002. That's 20 years ago. My kids were one little less than one year old at the time. There's a lot that has changed in, and, um, and Awareness is growing about the inherent danger of pesticides. It's been growing for a long time. We know we're having this PFAS issue. So pretty much everyone's aware about it now in our, on our committee and elsewhere. And the, the lack of access to com comprehensive information about pesticides is really a challenge. So I would like to make a motion that we have a committee bill and uh, that we can work on a draft together with recommendations. Using the, the information you've given us, uh, you're, just now you made a suggestion that we talk with stakeholders, uh, all of the, and you, you talked about, um, excuse me, I, take, I was taking notes. You talked about um, making, providing protection for of identifying information. All of those things can be part of this bill with the goal of, of helping you, the BPC, do the job that helped create your, your organization, which was to minimize pesticide use in the state. But how could you measure if we've minimized, if we're not measuring and taking collection of data of what we're applying? So, uh, so there's my motion that we um, make a committee bill. Representative Walsh, what, what do you mean though by a registry? That's my only question. I uh, Well, I had originally last, um, in the, be the beginning of the session, proposed LD 1159, mm -hmm. which was a pesticide res registry. And in that terms, I was using the registry is that everyone who sells and applies and Dr. and uh, Megan Patterson has, um, uh, you know, she did break it out to what states have a, a, where, where people are supposed to, who are selling or applying are supposed to share that information with the state. So in the same way, uh, but mine is that I, I'm requesting both that we have a record of who's selling pesticides in the state, and then who is applying pesticides in the state. And we can, as we develop that bill, talk about where the exceptions are, as, um, as Director Patterson talked about the exceptions that we already have in our own state. And so, But my goal is that we would have, I call this a registry because as every 10 years, we take a census in the US, why? So that we would know how many people we have because one of the goals of government is to serve the people. So in the same way, if we have regular data collection, not summaries of data, but actual data collection, then we would be able to use that information to do better governance. Okay, thank you. Representative Underwood. Second. Yes, uh, Director Patterson, I had one question regarding the term active ingredient. Could you define that according to sure. the BPL, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. I apologize for all of the, the jargony language that um, comes along with the pesticide world. Um, I think we do our best to try to uh, break it down into common parlance, but um, active ingredient essentially is, uh, there's a delineation in pesticides, active ingredient versus other ingredients. Um, pesticide products have active ingredients. Those are the, the materials that actually are doing the thing the product is being sold to do. So if it's an insecticide, those are the, the, act, the chem chemicals in that particular product that um, control, repel, kill that insect um, that it's intended to, to do that thing for. Um, same is true with disinfectants. So we've all become quite familiar with those because of the pandemic. Um, so the active ingredient in the disinfectant would be the thing that's meant to for example, kill, control, um, COVID-19. 
for example. Um, the other ingredients are, you know, much like, you know, your shampoo that you use every day or your, your you know, detergent that you use on your clothing. Um, you know, there are going to be ingredients that do other things. So they might be a colorant, it might be a scent, it might be um, even something that helps it be more compatible, uh, mixing with water, for example, uh, but doesn't necessarily do the thing that the product is being advertised to do. Does that, does that more or less make, make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Sure thing, yep. Before I ask for a second, I'd like to have any other questions that we have for uh, Director Patterson, and I think actually ask for Pam Breyer's um, presentation, and then we can come back to the second because it may reform a little bit, Representative OSHA, what you may want to include in your motion, at least initially, if you don't mind. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to second it, um, but conditionally, because I wanted to reframe the conversation a little bit. Um, I think registry is not the word we want to use, but more of a, a database. And Megan raised a lot of super specific points that I think we can take into account as we draft it. Thank you. And that's why I asked what you know was meant by a, a registry in this case. So, so I'll hold off on your second, if you don't mind, until we have um, Sam's presentation and I'll come back to you for the second. That's fine. Any other questions for Megan at the moment? Seeing none, welcome Pamela Bryant. Hello, good morning. Yep, we're still in the morning. Good morning, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and the members of the ACF committee. I am Pam Breyer. I'm the pesticides toxicologist for the BPC. I'm going to share my screen and pick up the presentation where Megan has left off. And my goal is uh, hopefully it will actually really inform the discussion that follows. So currently we are collecting some data. And when you look at the data that we collect, it looks like it is not very helpful. So I want to, when we were writing the report, I had about a week after the time that the data was finished being entered, and the report was due to go through the data and start developing some of the things we can do with the type of data we collect right now and giving you guys the an idea of what it looks like because we would need specifics um, and i'll show you an example and megan has mentioned this but what we ask the applicators specifically to report is really important for what we can report back out on so like megan mentioned um, this is 2019 application data. These data are only from commercial applicators. And so the commercial applicators may do agriculture in those conditions where a farmer has hired an outside applicator, and it may not include agriculture if they are private and making their own applications. So Megan mentioned there were about 360 conventional active ingredients and another 25 minimum risk pesticide active ingredients. Each year we register about 13,000 products. Those 13,000 products are really comprised of about 900 active ingredients that just get parsed out into different flavors, colors, and concentrations. So it's interesting that a lot more is being registered in the state than is actually being used in the state. And Megan mentioned the difference between how data are reported. And this is just an ugly fact about this world. And you can see this in the other states and how they deal with these data. Some of the data is gonna come in with a poundage and some of it is gonna come in in gallons. Sometimes it makes sense to convert everything to pounds. And I'll show you, there's other times where help me, I don't know if it makes sense or not. Um, so this is a table straight out of the report. In it, on the outset, it does look fairly um, un un uninforming, but I did find some interesting patterns in this. So this is solid. So this is all the data that was reported for commercial use in pounds to us. And one of the things that stood out was there's a huge section of poundage that's going to industrial uses. So a cooling tower, um, is, you know, they've got a slurry of water that needs to be maintained free of um, little greeblies and slimes. So they're using a lot of slimicides in those. 
just in poundage, that's a really impressive number for those compounds. But when we kind of take those out and don't look at them, the top three chemicals that we're looking at are all not exclusive to, so I'm not gonna say they're not used other places, but these are associated with potatoes in the, in the county. So there's, um, and we do know some things about herbicides. Herbicides tend to be used at a higher tonnage than insecticides. So you're always gonna see herbicides higher on these lists than not. And then there's just little bits that I picked out from this. The next pesticide down is bleach. So bleach has so many uses in so many different sectors. So it's not surprising that we have it way up here. And I've mentioned this before, from my perspective, this is a chemical of concern. This is the one most associated with how people injure themselves because of our familiarity with that compound. So its presence this high on the list is telling. Then at the bottom left, I've got brown tail moth and question mark. This is an area where it would be nice if we knew for the entries that we get the licensure category that the application was made under. And that's one of those details that we've um, recommended be added if more information is needed. We know that acephate is a very common chemical used in brown tail moth control. Is it this high up on this list because of brown tail moth? Could we be seeing patterns in pesticides for treatment of that particular pest from this kind of chart? So that, that would be something uh, more that we could get from this data. And then on the right hand side, it says newer insecticides, so chlorantranilprol. It's interesting to see, this is a very expensive um, compound, and it's interesting to see that its use is so high. Um, and it's being used to replace a lot of the older organophosphates and um, neonicotinoids. This is the same data, but for the gallons only. So commercial applicators, total of all of the liquid. And you can see, that glyphosate has jumped from 44th or 34th in solid to first in liquid. So that is interesting. That is a candidate where you would really want to take the density and convert it back into the solid. So you can really just track glyphosate as a solid. But then if you look at the other green bars that I have, we have a lot of compounds in the state, um, the minimum risk pesticides, and they're a little more difficult to quantify so garlic is being reported in gallons. And so that would be a challenge to even make me meaningful data of it in poundage. Mineral oil, rosemary oil too. Those are such complex mixtures. How to move forward with those uh, is something to consider. And that's part of what is the question that you want the data to tell you. This table is one I, I describe in the report, I made some decisions. So these broad applica application categories based on conversations that we hear about pesticide use. We hear about residential structures, we hear about agriculture, and then there's like little nuanced ones like rodents. And so I went through our data and did my best trying to parse out whether the application would fit one of these categories. And sometimes because we are living and breathing this, you can tell what AI was being used for what use, but sometimes it's more difficult. And this is an area where um, when we know what the goal is, what tables or charts would like the legislature would like to see, then we would know what questions to ask and kind of refine this. But it's still a really interesting approach to looking at the data because once you define a category and you can look at the total amount used, and I've only listed the top three, but in order of the most common use um, for each of these categories. And this is how we could really work with other stakeholders that are doing outreach, um, pesticides use in them. They can, you know, you can go to extension, for example, and say, these are the top five pesticides being used in this area. Is this what you've been recommending? How can education change? That's the type of um, direction that data can go. And I have two graphs, and they're the same graphs that are in the report. And again, it's the same data. It's just being parsed out differently. And this time, we're looking only at the active ingredient. And I picked everybody's favorite chemical, glyphosate, as my first example. And if you want to know how glyphosate is being used in the state, this can break it out into different use areas. Specifically with respect to um, schools, schools have turf. and 
um, other businesses have turf. And here we have a turf category. So that distinction that Megan keeps talking about and how to parse that out, if that data is wanted, it needs to just be explicitly stated so that we can find the words to request that data. When you look at this, you can see right of way uses are really large for glyphosate. Um, but again, this is going to be leaving out other categories. So we know that glyphosate is commonly used on a crop, a corn crop. Most of the time, those folks are private applicators and would not be included in this data. So this is a neonic, um, this is a metacloprid use, and you can see its use on turf is really high. So that really fits back with the, can't remember the LD for last session with the prohibition in residential areas. Um, you can really get the data for making informed decisions from breakdowns like this. That's all I have. I just really wanted to um, show you guys kind of some of the potential and how important the word choice of what we ask applicators really translates into meaningful data. Questions for either Pam or Megan, uh, Representative Underwood. Hi, uh, Mrs. Breyer, how should uh, brown tail communities, how should they treat the brown tail moth? What could be used to eradicate it or treat it? I get asked this question all the time and I immediately pass the buck. You need to ask um, Senator Dill in his <laughs> outfit. Um, we're not allowed to make pesticide recommendations. We're in the business of registering them. So although I hear a lot of the scuttlebutt, I can't answer that. But I can get you a, uh, I can connect you with somebody in the Forest Service that knows that answer. Please do, I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I want to um, second the motion that Representative Osher has made. And I think we can um, work with her uh, on mic, if you don't mind, Representative Osher, just to um, maybe give us like three bullet points of, of what you're thinking. And there are a lot of specific recommendations that uh, that Director Patterson has made that, um, that I don't think we need to list out right at this moment, but that um, Representative Osher could coordinate with Director Patterson on incorporating those in the bill. Representative O'Neill, I know when you spoke a, a little while ago, you did raise the question about registry versus database. So I'd like to see what the terminology is here that uh, we're looking at. So I would go back to Representative Osha first. All right, so um, what I'm proposing is a database. Okay. Fine with that vocabulary. Uh, I come to this as a scientist that's newly involved in government that has tried to find information and also know that as the government were already instilled with the goal of, of providing, of addressing this mission. So my, my focus is a database of sales and use uh, and comply, taking into account what Director Patterson says that that information would be protected and we'd have a discussion on what kind of protections so that those who are applying uh, specifically would be able to be protected from having their locations disclosed to the public. Although I do believe that location data is essential. We know that if, if the spreading of the sludge had been uh, geolocated in a database, it would be very easy now for us to go back and find out where PFAS where sludge was spread and find out what the PFAS contamination level is. And so this will help us in the future uh, because we, we do our best as humans to figure out how to use tools to make things better. And sometimes we find out later that those tools had some downsides as we've learned with PFAS. And so we need to go back often. So, uh, so my goal is a database with geolocation for sales, and, well, for geolocation for use and sales, register, sales database and that work, we work with the BPC uh, to figure out how to make sure that there's uh, uh, protection for um, and from FOA for the people who are supplying the information and using those those pesticide tools. Um, 
the, that I consider that there's plenty, I know that there's, there's plenty of technology available for that probably to be something that would make it easier for uh, people who are applying to provide the information as easy it is right now we have, you can register your car online, right? And that makes it very easy. So that we know that there's a possibility to have electronic databases that the state uses to keep track of things. And uh, so that's, so I would like it to be, uh, have an online interface, understanding that some uh, farmers will find that a challenge and therefore the BPC would also have to work with people who are not uh, because of lack of broadband or lack of technological capabilities cannot at this point do the uh, interface. But I'm sure that as time goes on, as more people get connected with technology, that that will also be um, more accessible. So I guess to summarize, database uh, protections uh, from FOA for the people who are putting information in the database and, and make that database something that uh, has an ease of use because of the technology available. So very similar to the bill that I put in earlier, uh, there, what I didn't hear from Director Patterson, and it probably would take funds to figure out, it would be to do an analysis of, of not just what she, she her uh, group was great about sending out information to other states and ask, sending a questionnaire and asking them questions, but probably there'd be, have to be a deeper dive into what states spend and what tools they use and which would be the best tools for us to use uh, to make this uh, useful for our state. Representative O'Neill, is that kind of where you are with seconding that? Yes, yeah, okay. that captures it. Okay. Thanks for your work on it. So we have a uh, <clears throat> motion on the floor, it's been seconded, we'll go into discussion. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to the Board of Pesticide Control and Ms. Patterson, Ms. Breyer for putting together the report. Um, I'm having a hard time locating it in my email, which I'm sure is my fault. Karen, would you mind resending it out? And the reason for that is just because um, I think there were a lot of recommendations in the report that really crossed with some of Representative Osher's um, intentions. And I would like to see that. And I'd like to make sure that we're coordinating our, our work uh, as we put together this committee bill. I, I think uh, Representative Pluker, as, as usual, if we pass it here to go to committee, you know the process, it takes a while, get the information, by the time it comes back to us, we'll have something in writing to react to, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll go to Karen, I'll come back to you guys in just a second. Karen has her hand up, so she's probably questioning what's being said, perhaps, if she's captured. No, no, I, I just wanted to res respond to Representative Pluker. Uh, yeah, it, it was submitted uh, quite some time, it feels like years now, but that's probably just a couple months. Um, but if if you go, I'll resend it, but also if you go on the committee's webpage right now, all the reports are there um, and it's, you know, BPC pesticide sales and use report. So it should be there, but I will uh, resend it to you. And I've already sent emails to uh, Director Patterson and also uh, Pam Breyer for their PowerPoint presentations, um, because I think it was a much more um, fr user-friendly format in terms of what the recommendations were in, in Director Patterson's uh, PowerPoint anyway. So um, I'll get that as well. And I don't know if the, I for, forgot what my other point was, but it's, oh, so my other question was, uh, it sounds like the committee wants to get this uh, referred back to ACF for uh, a regular public hearing and work session process. So um, that being said, the next legislative session is March 9 which does not give us a lot of time to develop this committee bill. So um, I would say by next Thursday, I would need to have this pretty much in some sort of form for the committee to review um, next Thursday to give revisers enough time to do um, their proofreading and, and technical stuff and legal review and all that. Great. Thank you. Representative Hall. Thank you, Senator Dill. I have a question. I believe it's going to be for Director Patterson. And that question is, um, with what 
Representative Osher has proposed here, can you explain to me what the difference is of what you folks already are um, gathering for information and have and for what she's asking for? I just don't want to see us to go to a lot of work and try to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, sure. I think maybe it's easiest to start with what we have, what we've built already. So we essentially built on to um, uh, more or less, it's a, it, it's a business, they call it a business software solution. That's just, it's, it's more than a database. It does all kinds of um, very complicated, really sophisticated um, data analysis and um, sort of logic um, uh, I guess, analysis, um, and that manages all of our programs. So um, that manages our licensing for applicators and businesses, our registration of pesticide products, also our enforcement program. We run all of those things through this system. So we've built onto that. That's what we've, we currently have. And we essentially took um, the current uh, reports that are in this, um, in this report as an addendum. I believe they are the first addendum actually. Um, so those are the ones that we're, we're allowed to collect at this point through um, by law. Uh, so it starts at appendix, I guess, um, section 10 in the appendices on page 25 of the report. Um, and those reports and the forms that they're based on are outlined through to page 29. Um, so there are a number of them. And right now that's what we're compiling. So we're compiling just that information that's collected. And so for commercial applicators, those people that are hiring their services out, currently we're collecting at a really high level, um, the site of application, so all, basically for every pesticide we use, summarized in total, this is how much of that pesticide we use. So let's say it's for tick and mosquito control and they're using a product, um, let's say it's called Bifen. It's going to say, here's how much bifen we used throughout the entire year for control of ticks and mosquitoes um, and give us the total amount um, of that product used. And it tells us that, it, you know, also that they were using it on, you know, for, for management of, you know, on residential turf, for example, or residential properties for the management of ticks and mosquitoes. Um, so that, that, that's basically the, that information that we're collecting. We're also collecting how much product was sold um, by restricted use pesticide dealers and how much uh, product was sold by wholesalers uh, to general use pesticide dealers or by essentially from a wholesaler to the general use pesticide dealer that you and I would interact with like a big box store, for example. So that's the information we're collecting right now. Um, we aren't collecting um, the daily application log. So we're not collecting every single application that's made on a day-to-day -day basis. So if an applicator goes out today and makes five applications, we're not getting that degree of granularity. We're getting at a much higher level at the end of the year, they summarize that information. So it's still capturing all of the use. It's just capturing it in a summarized fashion at the end of the year. And we aren't collecting names of anyone who is, is, is hiring these services um, or their specific address information, or for example, weather information, which is part of that, that log, um, as is the pest complex that was treated. Um, so brown tail moth, for example, it won't, it won't be that specific. It's a little more general than that. Um, and the information that Pam reported out, that's more or less a summary of the kinds of things that we could produce out of the current information. Um, so that's more or less what we're collecting. Um, I would say, you know, it would be a real consideration to, to need to develop something separate from our current system um, rather than simply modify our current system. Um, you know, that, that is something that, you know, it's, I'm putting on my thinking cap to consider, you know, what that, what that will mean, I guess, um, for additional work for BPC staff. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. Representative Landry. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. Is that going to be a test on this after we're through? <laughs> I can give you some cliff notes uh, if you if you need them. Uh, going back to Representative Hall's question, so is this a duplication of what you're already doing, or would you just have to include other data points? Yeah. So I guess it, it's not um, su super clear to me. Um, it sounds like there may be an expansion of, um, and and forgive me, I, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't know. I guess I don't know if it will be an expansion of what we're already collecting. I assume so. I assume this will also include agricultural producers, and that the information about who is making the applications, where they're making those applications, and and potentially for whom they're making those applications would be then protected under FOIA. I think that's what's being proposed. Um, 
but it would be an expansion of what we're already doing. So we don't currently collect any um, even summary form of information. None of that information from agricultural producers has to come to our offices. All of these folks have to maintain records, but they have to make those records available to BPC staff upon request. Um, so we, we cannot require them to submit them to us um, in sort of an electronic or mailed in form. We have to request them directly. Typically that's through an on-site visit, through an inspection um, that we would be working with the records that they, they have currently. Um, so their agricultural producers are not required to report anything to us and that would be an expansion poten potentially of the current requirements. Uh, follow up? Sure. Uh, I like the idea of the protection of privacy, but the FOIA thing, is it possible to prohibit it? Well, that's a good question. I, I think probably that's a question for your legal counsel. Um, I, I have heard that um, there have been successful, but again, I can't give you any specific examples. Um, so it's a little bit more hearsay than anything that there have been successful FOIAs of um, other information that's technically protected. So confidential statements of formula for pesticide products are protected by federal law, but I have heard of states having to turn that information over, but I'm, I'm not personally familiar with having to have done that here in Maine. So, um, but again, I think, you know, that would be a question for legal counsel in terms of whether or not, um, you know, some kind of protection provided in statute could be challenged. I, I just don't know. Thank you very much. You did a good job. Representative Osher. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I, I think those are really good questions. Uh, the, my um, proposal of a database is really so that we would have that valuable information to protect citizens and to investigate, you know, future issues, uh, just like the PFAS issue, we ha be having the data of where it was applied would be so helpful right now. So, uh, and I've already established a relationship with uh, Director Patterson. And so I'm certainly discussing all of the details with her would be part of developing this. Yes, we have a short timeline. Uh, so, uh, but I'm sure that we'd be able to come to some discussion, you know, be able to discuss these things. So the this is, but it does appear that it's separate because the idea, you know, as government, one of the things that we do, not our committee, but our gov governments oversee public schools, having an annual summary of how many children are in the school is valuable, but it doesn't give enough information. And that's how, that's why schools need to actually say how many students are in each class. And they also have to test the kids to find out how they're doing. So uh, in the same way, having a su summary information for some pesticide uh, application isn't really giving us the kind of information that helps us do our job as government. And so this is what, I, what I'm proposing. As far as the FOIA, uh, I think uh, Director Patterson, that's very inf interesting information that, for, that, that for people have had, that FOIA has been, uh, the, the protection from FOIA for disclosing uh, formulation was one some case, but I think that this is the, the this was the protection of the people who are applying from having their neighbors or their customers. If we if we're also adding agricultural you know farmers to this, this was an idea to to put into this bill to protect those farmers. So the information about what they applied is available to the BPC and available in aggregate, but is not available to the public as a specific so that locations won't disclose who the applier is. So that's, that, that was the, the FOIA workaround I was looking for. Karen, did you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, assuming that, um, you know, however the data is protected, if it's uh, protected by the federal government, does not much that we can do, but if it's um, if it's a public record under state law, I actually flip that around. So if if it's a public record on the federal level, there's not much we can do about it. But if it's a public record on the state level, then we can just draft a public records exception, uh, which has been done before. And so that would be subject to review by the Judiciary Committee. Um, so that's another thing, uh, you know, maybe at the point after the public hearing and, you know, there's a work session, probably at that point, um, one of the chairs of the committee would go before the Judiciary Committee if you have that sort of proposal. And then you do with 
uh, Judiciary Committee's recommendation what you will. You can you know, change it. You can just move forward with the committee amendment, assuming there's one. So that's that's the process for public records exceptions. Thank you, Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But I, I think I the question's been answered. So today, the motion before us is to report out a committee bill. That's that's as simple as it is. Yes. Yeah, and and that would have to be printed, uh, drafted, printed. Then it would have to come back to a public hearing. And then after the public hearing, it would have to come um, back to a work session. Correct. Um, so if a member of this committee votes for this today, he's only voting for a committee uh, bill to come back. He's not voting in favor of this. And, and my That's correct. correct. All, all we're doing today is the vote on rather, you know, this warrants more discussion, public hearing, et cetera. Thank you. Representative O'Neill. Oh, thank you. That lingering hand, but um, <laughs> Senator Black articulated what I was thinking. It's just maybe we could have these conversations at the public hearing and right. Representative Mosher <laughs> work with Director Patterson because there's a lot of great work that's gone into this and she can take care of that, I think, leading Exactly. Up. Any other discussion? Karen. Uh, I wanted to put my hand down, but I hit screen share. Um, uh, and I, I just want to make you aware that, um, you know, that's not the only way the committee could move forward with the committee bill, but that seems to be what you all would like at this time. Another option is just to, um, to develop the bill and then to report it out and it goes to the floor and, and it doesn't get back to the committee. So I just wanted to make you aware that that's another option, but it doesn't sound like what you all wanna do with this particular bill. Uh, no, I think we need to have a public hearing and work session on it. This is uh, uh, you know, pretty important. And so. so with that, any other discussion? Cheryl, would you please call the roll? Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative mm -hmm. Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Absent. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. And that's unanimous of those in attendance. All right. Um, on, uh, let's see, uh, LD, well, there's no LD on my sheet, but on the sales report, we're going to report out a bill, committee bill, and it passes unanimously of those present. So I'll close uh, this hearing report, I mean, and we'll move on to the work session on LD 1075, an act to protect public lands. I believe this is Senator Bennett's bill, and I see that he's here. So with that, wherever Karen is, there she is on my screen. Would you give us your lovely synopsis? Thank you, Senator. Um, so this bill is a carryover. Um, it uh, proposes to require the Bureau of Parks and Lands to adopt rules that establish an objective evaluation process for determining if a proposed activity on designated land would cause the land to be reduced or substantially altered. And then it also uh, provides that those rules are major substantive rules. So uh, we had uh, this bill and we had LD 471 uh, initiated bill, um, LD 1295. Obviously a lot of those bills were 
um, precipitated by uh, the lease agreement between the state of Maine and central Maine power and the transmission uh, corridor project. So the committee heard this bill last April and you voted to carry it over about a month later, uh, given all that was going on uh, with this topic. And of course there was the, um, the ballot question in, in November. So uh, here we are at the work session and I'm gonna go back to the language of the bill. Uh, I know you've all heard this before many times, but um, I just wanna you know, quickly go over that um, the Constitution of Maine, Article 9, Section 23, there is a provision, I'm gonna paraphrase, um, that state park land or other real estate held by the state for conservation or recreation purposes and designated um, by legislation may not be reduced or its uses substantially altered except on the vote of two thirds of all members of elected to each house. So there's that constitutional provision. And then in, in statute, um, uh, uh, there are statutory provisions that back that up in Title 12 um, in um, Section 598 and 598A. And 598 is definitions. And so there are um, two definitions in particular that are important. It defines reduced, which is more straightforward, uh, means a reduction in the acreage of an individual parcel or lot designated uh, of, of a lot uh, designate as designated land under 598A. And then it also uh, defines substantially altered. Um, it, it's quite a long provision, but I'll just read the first uh, statement, the uh, first sentence, substantially altered in the use of designated lands means changed so as to significantly alter physical characteristics in a way that frustrates the essential purposes for which that land is held by the state. And then another important piece of this is 598A um, is literally a list of uh, designated lands. So um, again, it, it basically uh, reiterates the provision in the constitution um, in statute that the following lands are designated lands under the constitution of Maine, article nine, section 23. So these lands include or are, uh, first we have certain department of IFNW lands uh, such as state owned wildlife management areas and public access sites and also lands held and managed at state game farms. Uh, and, and there are provisions describing those things in other places in Title 12. And then obviously uh, there are certain lands of the Bureau of Parks and Lands. And then I think um, there are other subsections, but I think another uh, important one are Baxter State Park Authority lands. So lands managed by Baxter State Park Authority, not acquired by deed, gift, deed of gift and not contiguous to Baxter State Park. So um, lands deeded by Governor Baxter by deeds of gift and lands managed by the authority that are contiguous to Baxter State Park are not designated lands. Um, so going back to the testimony, there was a lot of testimony in support of the bill, including uh, from the Bureau of Parks and Lands. Uh, Baxter, there was no opposition to the bill. Um, Baxter State Park Authority uh, testified neither for nor against, and they raised that issue that uh, there are other, um, there are lands designated that are not Bureau of Parks uh, lands. So there are the Department of IF, IF and W uh, managed lands. And then there are um, some parcels uh, that are, are managed by Baxter State Park Authority. And I guess um, in uh, Eben Sipitowski's uh, testimony, he talked about there are two parcels that were acquired by the authority for the purpose of forest management uh, that would be subject to um, this bill. And, and one parcel is in Mount Chase and the other in Harpswell. So I guess um, in terms of some suggestions at the public hearing, um, I think the, the Bureau was more um, direct that they would one of the suggestions would be to 
um, consider limiting the application of this bill to only lands administered by P BPL. Um, and I, it, it sounds like Baxter State Park Authority uh, may also agree with that suggestion. Um, and then the other suggested amendment uh, that was made by the Bureau of Parks and Lands was to um, make these rules routine technical ra rather than major substantive. Although the sponsor of the bill, uh, Senator Bennett made it clear that he is not interested in that, um, that he would like them. He is not interested in routine technical rules. He um, it would like them to be major substantive. Uh, so I'll leave it at that for now. So um, then Karen, this bill basically would take and help to try to define even further the definition of uh, substantial alteration is that where we are and I mean we can deal with the designated land part of it later as we are discussing but is that the crux of what we're dealing with here um, it it establishes uh, it, and in the bill language is objective evaluation process for determining if it's been uh, land has been reduced or substantially altered so I think um, the, you know, and Senator Bennett can speak to his intent, but I think in my mind, the intent is to make a more transparent process of how uh, these decisions are arrived at. All right. Thank you. Other questions for Karen before we move on? Welcome, Senator Bennett. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good to be with you. It's been a while since we've heard this bill, so... Uh, <laughs> Um, as I was trying to figure out the intent here, I know you and I have had a little brief discussion about it, but uh, would you be so kind as to kind of uh, bring us up to speed on intent here? Sure. I'm really grateful for the opportunity, and I think uh, as you know, um, summarized it very well and my position very well. So I appreciate that. Yeah. The, the transparency is the critical thing. We, the, these decisions are extraordinarily important. Uh, one was rendered in particular, which has been a, you know, a bone of contention uh, as a mild word for the last many years. Um, now that we've moved beyond that, uh, I think it's critical. And this bill was always prospective. It never really related to that lease, unlike the other bill that you had. It was... And I, I just want to say uh, quickly, I was on the conference committee in 1993 as a member of the House of Representatives that wrote Article 9, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution. There were three senators and three House members. It was a, it was a, it was a, nobody really disagreed with it, but it was a question of getting the language right. And we actually expanded it to include as many public lands as possible. I'll set aside the Baxter State Park thing. Um, and the, the laws work really well over the many years. And the executive branch has come to the, the legislative branch repeatedly with requests under you know, the, the, the two thirds requirement. This one didn't happen, the, the CMP lease, and it opened up a lot of questions. Um, setting aside the substance of that issue, um, there's a lot of feeling that the process wasn't transparent and that people, we, we should know by what criteria um, the Bureau of Parks and Lands arrives at the question of substantial alteration. And in fact, Judge Michaela Murphy, this past summer in her ruling on that lease, pointed this problem out from the judicial branch's point of view. I was really pleased the executive branch testified in favor. So I think that we're all in agreement, judicial, executive, and legislature, that we should fix this. And I think it's really important to have transparency. And um, I know that the lead co-sponsor of this bill, who happens to be your house chair, Representative O'Neill, has been working to perfect some of the language here too. And I defer to, to her. She's kept me apprised of, of that. And I fully support her work in doing that. Uh, but major substantive rules critically important because, and I'll leave with this, the Constitution gives the legislature not, not only the um, right, but the responsibility of 
reviewing substantial alterations. So it's critical that if we're going to delegate any of that responsibility to the executive branch, that the legislature review the rules and consider the major substantive on, a, on this constitutional question of, uh, of what constitutes um, major and substantive and how they go about that work. And so I just think this is a, it will be very helpful to the process going forward to make these rules major substantive. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Senator Bennett? Representative O'Neill, could we have uh, some of your thoughts, please? Thank you. Um, so in total agreement um, about the content of the bill, which would require a substantial alteration decision to be made, put a process in place, have a public process, a written decision, rights of appeal. Um, I'm in agreement with the sponsor that this should be major substantive rules. Um, and then two things that Karen raised um, that I, or one thing that I wanna make a suggestion about um, seems to be about whether BPL would adopt rules for other agencies or bureaus like um, IFNW and, and Baxter. And my intent would not be that BPL would adopt rules for Baxter and, um, and IFNW, but that each of those entities would make their own process for these designated lands and how to have this kind of public process um, available. And then one more thing that I did want to ask, and um, Karen, I think I have sent it to you, um, would just make a couple tweaks to the language to emphasize the public trust responsibility. Do you, you want, would you like me to forward your email or I can read what you drafted Representative O'Neill? Trying to open it. I can open it. Or do you, do you have it available to share on screen? Or I can just uh, read it too, that's easier. Yeah, that's probably easier. Okay. Um, so I guess right from the first line, um, so it's a, the, the bill, the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, Bureau of Parks and Lands shall adopt rules and Representative O'Neill's language would be something like to ensure observance of the restrictions contained in Article 9, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution um, and to ensure proper exercise of its public trust responsibility, these rules must, and then it continues on with established objective evaluation process. So just, I guess, some sort of language uh, driving home the public trust um, uh, responsibility and, and duty. And does it say that it has to be substantive? Rulemaking uh, routine. That's the original. That's the original bill as drafted. And, okay. um, I'm he I'm hearing from the committee members anyway that there's no interest in changing that. So uh, you know what I did. I think um, you know from our pers from OPLA perspective that that public trust responsibility um, is is already baked in, if you will, to uh, common law, um, but. I guess adding that extra language doesn't do any harm either, so. Does that also cover, um, I can't remember if it was Representative O'Neill or Senator Bennett that said it, that covers the uh, <clears throat> aspect of just the Bureau of Public Lands that we're not gonna include Baxter or IF&W designated lands, et cetera. Well, I'm hearing from Representative O'Neill oh, yeah. that she would like uh, those two uh, entities to also adopt rules um, for their own designated lands in addition to Bureau of Parks and Lands. That is what yep. I'm suggesting. And, and my reasoning is just because this land could have just as easily been held by IFNW. You know, it could have been another designated land. So I think I heard the sponsor articulate something similar that they were careful about what lands were included and protected. Other questions? Does someone wanna make a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move ought to pass as amended um, the way I articulated it with the, um, the piece about public trust. Okay, 
Is there a second? I'd second that. It's been moved by Representative O'Neill, seconded by Senator Black. Any further discussion? Representative Pluker. I just had a quick question. Are we including the IFNW and Baxter piece in this bill, or are they going to, we're assuming they're going to handle that on their own? I guess that Karen, was. Is that, will, as drafted, will it reflect that? Uh, no. So I'm hearing uh, from Representative O'Neill that the, this bill would be amended so that it would explicitly say that Baxter State Park Authority and IFNW must also promulgate rules uh, to establish a process to determine what you know substantially altered use of land is. Um, That'd be my intent, yes. Okay. But are they then under the same, um, jurisdiction or whatever you want to call it of the legislature that if they want to do it they'd have to have a two-thirds vote whereas they do they, they, they do not have to do that now well I, I don't know how to answer that so I mean really now um, the state does regardless of agency but the I guess the issue that this bill is trying to resolve is that some people feel that that did not happen. Uh, with the, uh, the lease agreement between CMP and the state. So this is directing, I guess what Representative O'Neill's amendment is um, doing is it rather than directing the Bureau of Parks and Lands to adopt rules for a process that would apply to age, two other agencies, essentially, it's saying each agency adopt rules for your own process for um, coming to that decision okay. so that uh, Baxter State Park Authority and IFNW are, you know, it seems, it does seem a bit awkward to have the Bureau of Parks and Lands, uh, you know, promulgate rules that apply to two other state agencies. Yep. No, I agree. I just want to see where, where we are on this. Is it a, one group or is it several and it sounds like it's several each group would make their own designated lands yeah and i i mean i i will say, if you look at baxter state park authority's testimony however i don't think they feel like that's necessary because there are deed restrictions and management plans you know um so they but you know, that wasn't on Baxter State Park per se. It was only a couple of other plots that they had. You mentioned Mount Chase and someplace else. Harpswell, yeah. yeah. But those okay. are under the jurisdiction. Those are designated lands under the jurisdiction of the authority. Right, so this exactly. Bill will to them. Yeah. But it's not Baxter State Park per se that has to do this. Correct, or, not okay. the big chunk yeah. of the land. yeah. Representative McCray. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this may be a question for either Representative O'Neill or for Ms. Meadow. Uh, I heard either one of you or both maybe saying that and that the IFNW must. This is left up to them as to whether they want to, to change the rules or whatever. We're only concerned about BPC in this committee. Am I understanding that correctly? EPL. Well, I think what I could say in answer to that representative is that um, as Senator Bennett outlined, um, folks were clear about the land that should be protected by the constitution and what should be subject to legislative review and land held by Baxter and, and IFNW falls within those designated lands. And um, just how this happened with land that happened to be held by BPL, it could have happened to land happened held by IFNW. So I think across the board, it makes sense to ask the departments to make a public process um, where they make a decision about whether there's a substantial alteration or not, and then create a written decision and rights of appeal. So it's a pretty, pretty standard process that we're asking for, just to make it a little more formal and tidy. Uh 
a, a brief follow up, Mr. Chair. Sure. Well, what I'm concerned about, Representative, is are we making rules and applying them to other committees, other departments, or are we making them for ACF? According to this, where we stand right now with this bill. What we'd be asking, as I understand it, is for um, is for BPL and IFNW to come back with a public process to be reviewed. And I think Karen can answer whether IFNWs would go to IFNW or us if it's substantive. But um, but it's just saying, please develop a, a public process and come back to us with what that public process looks like. Okay. Thank you. Karen? Uh, yeah, so uh, again, I think Representative O'Neill's uh, intent for what I'm hearing is that each agency would adopt its own rules on how it determines uh, if use of designated lands under its jurisdiction um, is reduced or substantially altered. Um, so since these are major substantive rules, I'm um, assuming that the major substantive rule resolve relating to IFNW lands uh, would go to IFNW. I'm not sure. I mean, that's really a decision when it comes to re the committee reference. Um, and then the same for Baxter State Park Authority. I know just my experience with education, like, uh, you know, with vaccines that DHHS and DOE jointly you know, adopt rules. So I, I'm not sure what makes the most sense here, but um, it was raised as an issue by Baxter State Park Authority that it seemed um, a little awkward to them to have BPL adopt rules about how this decision is made um, that would apply to them. So, um, but I think for now, uh, what I'm hearing from Representative O'Neill is like she she would like all three agencies to undergo this process separately. Okay. Senator Black. Thank you. And I agree with the amendment that Representative Neal has put forward. Um, and it seems a little awkward, but I think it, it is it is uh, allowing, you know, and and, and uh, Baxter State Park did, you know, question it, but um, probably Baxter State Park's not the one we're gonna worry about. We do have a lot of IFNW land out there and with the LMF bond and and a new uh, bill that was presented in, in IFNW, there's gonna be more and more IFNW land out there. So this could, this could happen anywhere in the state, just what happened with the with the corridor. So I think it's crucial that we move ahead and 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 with this legislation and and include those two and allow them to make their own um, rules. But uh, I think this legislation is is telling them it needs to be done. You know, and if we're you know, so that's I think that's where we are. I'm not we're not making rules for them. They're going to make their own rules, but. Uh, uh, it's it's critical that all the land that we have in trust in the state of Maine is protected from something like what happened here in, in BPL. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Underwood. Uh, Senator Black answered any questions I had with his statement, so I appreciate you calling on me. Thank you. Okay. Any other Discussion. Seeing none, Cheryl, please call the roll. Yes, LD 1075 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, absent. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. No. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. And what would your motion be? There's too many rules and regulations that government has. We should be 
uh, reducing rules and regulations on our landowners. They do an excellent job managing the land as is. There may be had a problem in the past with BPL, but it should be resolved by the courts. And to say if the agreement or whatever it is, it's illegal or it's legal, one or the other. And again, a no vote is 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 um, is my is my vote. Thank you. Ought not to pass, right? Ought not to pass. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Nine yes, one ought not to pass, and three absent. On LD 1075, an act to protect public lands, uh, ought, to, ought to pass as amended passes. And I will call, close the public, I mean, the work session on this issue. Thank and you very much. Thank you, Senator Bennett, Representative O'Neill. Okay, we'll move on. Yes, Karen. Um, I just, so before we move on to the next briefing, um, Representative Underwood just emailed me a question about committee bills. So I thought this would be a good opportunity since I have heard interest in another committee bill um, relating to the briefing you're going to hear in a minute. Um, but uh, just the, the vote that was taken earlier. I, I, so you, you have asked in some cases for a, a lot of these reports to be submitted to the committee, back to the committee, and you have authority to submit a bill relating to the subject matter of the report. So you may or may not decide to submit a bill. And so uh, um, you receive the reports and you have a discussion. And then it, in quite a few cases this session, you have the committee has decided to submit a committee bill. And so, um, that committee bill is just a proposal relating to the report you received from you know whatever agency. And um, again, there are two tracks it could take from there. You could either um, have have the uh, bill referred back to committee, so kind of go through the regular process of a public hearing and a work session. Um, that's usually what I recommend because it gives an opportunity for the public to weigh in. Um, but then there's also uh, another track it could take where the committee works on your committee bill and you report it out and it goes straight to the house and the floor for um, you know, consideration in, in the two bodies. And sometimes that's the case if, you know, an issue has been discussed um, at length. So anyway, I hope that answers your question, Representative Underwood. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on to LD 1407, Authority of Municipalities to Regulate Timber Harvesting. It's a briefing from the department and I see Director Cormier here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Did you want me to just get going? I, are you the only one that's presenting? I just wanted to make sure unless there's someone else in the uh, attending that needs to be here with you also? No, it's just myself and Director Mancius. Okay, and I see he's on already, so go ahead. Please. Great. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'm Patty Cormier, Director of the Maine Forest Service, and I'll be starting out this afternoon with an overview of our report out on the resolve for um, LD 1407. Don, or Director Mancius, is going to be running a uh, short PowerPoint, and he will bring up the 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 end, and we'll be following with the recommendations. So um, today we're gonna cover a quick review of how we, how we got to this point. So uh, what the Maine Forest Service did, what, the, what you folks had asked for, who was involved, 
what we covered, the current law, the issues we discussed and addressed, and the issues we discussed and didn't address, and then ending with the recommendations and any questions you might have. So the resolve directed the Maine Forest Service to convene a stakeholder group to assess and review Title 12, subsection 8869, which is the um, process relating to a municipal proposal to adopt or amend a timber harvesting ordinance. So the resolve directed us to report out to you folks the findings and recommendations of the stakeholder group to you. And I just wanted to add, I, um, in this process, I, I clearly heard from when this went to the resolve that communication and education was a strong component of what was asked for. So that also is a strong component in these recommendations today. So the makeup of the stakeholder group um, in the resolve, you can see there was a broad range of folks. It was a great group. I, I, rec I really appreciate their time for the four meetings we had. Uh, we had to cover a lot and most of them were at the meetings and there was very dynamic discussion and it was a really good group. Uh, we couldn't cover everything in the time allotted, but you'll see what we, what we did end up with. So again, I'm, I'm very thankful for these folks. So the next slide, Don. So the four meetings we had were virtual, but the link to the meetings were well, well advertised through the DACF media routes and main forest service avenues, including all social media. They were always scheduled early in the morning and lasted anywhere from two and a half to three and a half hours. Anyone wishing to observe from the public was encouraged to observe the meetings and provide comment. All the meetings were recorded and can be found um, on our website under, uh, if you go to Maine Forest Service under projects, it's on the left. So in these meetings, we had presentations from Maine Municipal, from municipalities, a DOT representative, because we were um, early on, we were discussing road issues. We had a presentation from the Bureau of Agriculture on the Farmland Protection Act as well as from consulting foresters. So these, um, these presentations were at the request of the stakeholders. So going through, um, going through the current law, so currently this is what's in, um, since 1999, we had covered this in the work session in the, in the public hearing, but right now a licensed forester must participate in the development or amendment of an ordinance. The Maine Forest Service must be consulted during that development or amendment, and the municipality must hold a public hearing and Maine Forest Service must be accorded the opportunity to speak. And landowners must be notified of the proposed ordinance or amendment. So we, we covered this at length and there was some interesting, um, Maine Municipal did a survey um, during in between meetings of municipalities and to hear the, um, the number of towns who weren't aware of this and were also clearly appreciative of any state assistance in their, um, in their ordinances. So also required municipalities that had forestry ordinances at the time to ensure the definitions used in the ordinances were consistent with state law or rule by January of 2001. Next slide. So this is just a, a quick listing of um, the issues we discussed in these four meetings. So again, um, overarching was uh, communications and education because as I said before, that had been a clear directive from, the, from you folks. Um, statutory clarifications and establishing reporting and certification deadlines and address establishment and maintenance of the ordinance list. And then next slide is the issues that um, were discussed but not addressed. And we simply, we really didn't have time to, to dig into these issues. So 
unreasonable permit fees, uh, penalties for frivolous lawsuits against timber harvest activities conducted in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations, time of day issues. And we had started um, in on road issues, but determined that there's already um, other avenues going on with DOT and other uh, legislative items that are addressing road issues. So we decided that that would not be something that this um, this group would address. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Don, but I just wanted to add it was a really um, a good a good group, um, very very involved, a lot of involvement with everybody, and we also had, um, as I said, speakers from towns, foresters, municipalities. Um, and MMA that were um, provided good feedback. And so um, I hope you guys appreciate the recommendations and um, I'll give it over to Don. Uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee. My name is Donald Manfius. I'm Director of Forest Policy and Management for the Maine Forest Service. The uh, <clears throat> uh, committee came up with a package of eight recommendations, which I will try to walk through as briefly as I can. So the first recommendation focused on communications, and it really comes down to the main Forest Service, MMA, and other uh, partner organizations to coordinate a regular and continued uh, effort to inform municipalities about what the law is regarding the local ordinances, offer outreach to the towns to uh, help them uh, comply with the processes and, and continue uh, public outreach, which we do all the time anyway, about the value of sound forest management and, uh, and what uh, timber harvesting looks like on the ground and, and keep that communication uh, going. Second, <clears throat> second and third recommendations are to clarify in statute what constitutes a forestry ordinance that requires main forest service review and limit that review to timber harvesting activities as that's defined in statute and make a clear distinction between timber harvesting activities as it's now defined and clearing for development. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of municipal activity that's in reaction to timber harvesting that happens as a uh, result in, in clearing for development. It's not forest management, uh, but the towns are reacting to that when they uh, enact their ordinances dealing with forestry. Our recommendation, our fourth one, is to establish a process and statute for certification either that a municipality certifies to Maine Forest Service that it has followed the process prescribed in law, or that uh, Maine Forest Service certifies that a municipality has followed the process once we receive notification. That's similar to how DEP handles shoreline zoning ordinances, and it's the preferred approach. Uh, fifth recommendation is to <clears throat> establish a new deadline for municipalities, excuse me, <clears throat> with existing forestry ordinances to make all their definitions consistent with definitions in law or main forest service rule by a date certain. Uh, that requirement is current in law, but it, we're not sure that it's been followed. <clears throat> and municipalities would need to document that they've updated their definitions. Uh, sixth recommendation, municipalities that have not previously followed the process would have until, say, the end of June of next year to submit those ordinances to Maine Forest Service for review and comment, and then follow the process uh, prescribed in law and complete that process by uh, June 2026, or their ordinance would be void. The seventh uh, recommendation is to require that local forestry ordinances be consistent with policies in a state certified comprehensive plan, which uh, you will find in uh, Title 30A, Section 4352. And finally, uh, provide additional direction and statute for the Maine Forest Service to maintain a list of local ordinances similar to the law that 
uh, re regarding registration of Venus fluorinenses regulating pesticides over uh, BPC. With that, I will finish my part of the presentation and open it up for questions. Are there any questions for <clears throat> either of our two presenters? Yes, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm not sure who to pose my question to, whether it was Director Cormier or um, Mancius who was most involved with the process. Um, but I'm just curious if you could draw a line of how we got from a right to forestry to here and, um, and why those things were agreed upon as being important, just so that I can understand. Because what I'm remembering is that um, is that I was really concerned about um, about the right to forestry, and something I was seeing was that there wasn't a lot of communication in place. So I requested those meetings, and I appreciate those took place. But I just like to hear, like, how does how does this line connect? How does that pesticide ordinance connect? It just seems um, like a bit of a reach, and I I'd, I'd like to understand a little better. So I can I can take that. Uh, so yeah, so this all started with a um, a bill uh, sponsored by Senator Black, and there was quite a bit of um, angst over the bill and testimony, and um, a lot of it was over concern that that this included kind of a um, you know control of ordinances to do with pesticides. And um, it, it, he, Representative O'Neill, you saw and you had said, due to the testimony that um, you saw a pattern of maybe the, maybe the current um, requirements of towns getting with the Forest Service and MMA and the main Forest Service working together was a little fractured, I guess. And so you would stress, you know, this should be about communication and bolstering outreach. And it came out as a, as a resolve for us to have those meetings. And we had, um, in these meetings, we, we had no intention of, of um, dealing with pesticides issue and ordinances. So that was off the table in this group. So we started off not um, that that was not part of the kind of rebooting of this uh, of this system, and so out of that came the direction of okay, how how can MMA Maine Forest Service work together? How can we possibly reboot? I guess this this ordinance system because uh, many towns don't even know it exists. It's been so long. There's transition of folks. So that's kind of a, a brief description of how the transition of how it started to how it ended. Thanks. Um, I think I just saw something really brief that was a recommendation that had to do with pesticides. And I guess more I was just expressing, it seemed like a little beyond the scope of, of what I had requested, but I, I wanted to hear how it isn't beyond the scope, I guess, like how how you thought it was connected to um, to better communication and process. Because something I saw was that there were laws on the books, but there was a failure um, on the part of of Maine Forest Service and um, and municipalities to communicate about this and and make sure people knew about it. So I did do appreciate you leading with that. Because just like Representative Underwood was saying on his last vote, I think before we make new laws, we need to know that we're um, that we're working with the ones we have. So. Yeah, thank you for that, and I I agree. And you you look, I see these recommendations as bolstering communications, clarifying language that is confusing to towns, and. Um, you know, working with MMA, as I said, and municipalities to, um, to really, we need to educate better the municipalities of, of what the current ordinances are. And then there's, um, there's in the recommendations, we're suggesting improvements to those ordinances as far as clarifying language. 
Okay. Yeah. I, I would, for one, am uncomfortable with recommendations of voiding people's ordinances if they don't, you know, go through a process in, in around a year, but just want to express that. But I do appreciate your work around outreach and I'm hoping that will be helpful going forward that there's been, that these connections have been made and you've taken the time to do this and um, I'm heartened by that. So. It's, it's always good to, to have these conversations that haven't been had in a long time. So it was a good exercise. Other discussion? Questions, I mean? Oh, Senator Black, sorry, I didn't see a hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think this is directed to, uh, directed to Kamiya, but uh, um, there was concerns when, when this bill was brought forth and I brought it, brought it forth on behalf of the department. Uh, and I think there were people that felt that there was a hidden agenda or in it or whatever, but uh, we tried, we, we asked in committee to have a stakeholders group to look at this because the department felt that it was an important issue that we needed to move forward on and get everybody, you know, as, as co-chair Neil has talked about communications and people understanding that there are rules and stuff out there. So we asked for a stakeholders group, I believe, uh, on that stakeholders group, towns, foresters, um, OFCA, um, um, forestry groups, foresters were all, were they, was the stakeholders group um, unanimous in their recommendations that they set forth? I, I mean, was it a unanimous uh, support for the recommendations that you brought forth today? Yeah, so um, with the recommendations, everybody had um, the chance for input on that. And there were no um, dissensions from, from those recommendations. So nobody came out against them. So everybody, everybody agreed that, that said something. And then the report went out um, as draft for comments. And there were no, um, all the comments were incorporated from, from the different stakeholder groups. So it was basically majority consensus. And so what is your, as director of forestry department, what is your, uh, what is your, what would you like to see become of the recommendations that you presented us today, a, a, a bill? of some sort? Yeah, I think um, um, kind of the, these recommendations are basically a, a package deal of, of what could happen and um, a bill to support that would be, would be a good idea. Thank you. Representative McCray. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I apologize for having been back and forth between committees. Uh, I, I would just like a couple of general questions. Uh, Number one, uh, do all communities have uh, a forestry plan or is this those that have should uh, tailor them so that they meet with your recommendations? I don't know whether that's for Mr. Mangus or Director Cormier. You wanna take that one, Don? Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there not all communities have standalone uh, forestry ordinances, okay. but many do. And the law has required for over 20 years a, that the towns wishing to adopt or amend forestry ordinances follow a process that's prescribed in law regarding consultation with the main forest service, use of a licensed forester, uh, public meetings and all of that. <clears throat> and uh, Representative uh, Senator Black brought forward this bill based in, in part on the uh, understanding that there are uh, communities out there that have not followed the process. We, we become aware of uh, these things after the fact, uh, but we have no recourse once, uh, once the community has acted. So this process that uh, the resolve uh, uh, put forward has started that process of communication with municipalities and we've we've put forward this package of recommendations to better uh, define the process and get the word out to towns 
about what they need to do to to uh, bring everybody into alignment. Very good. Mr. Chair, a brief follow-up? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so if a community, I don't care, wherever, if a community has forested land and no ordinance, can the owner just hire a forestry company to come in and, you know, uh, start cutting wood? Yes, they can. However, there are state laws and rules <clears throat> governing timber harvesting. The Maine Forest Service administers most of them. We have laws and rules governing clear cutting, harvesting mm -hmm. in shoreland areas, harvesting in protection subdistricts in the land use protection, uh, land use planning commission's jurisdiction, liquidation harvesting. Uh, we pretty well cover the gamut. But they don't necessarily need to have a local ordinance to govern that. They do not. Okay, thank you. I'm set. Thank you very much. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion that we report out a committee bill that incorporates all eight recommendations of what we heard today. All right. Just before I ask for that second, I'll do like I have been doing. Are there, are there any other questions directed towards either of our two guests here? Can I have a second? Representative Landry has seconded it. Further discussion? Representative Hall, were you just going to second it? Yes, I was just going to second the motion. Thank you. Okay. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering, I don't understand the unfunded mandate um, part of our constitution well enough, but I'm wondering if some of these forcing the the municipalities to go through this process might touch on that. So when we have the report back, I'd love to hear any analysis coming from that direction from Ms. Nato. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks for the question. Any further discussion? Representative McCray. I'm looking for my hand and on mute. Uh, I'm going to support reporting out a bill but I don't want it to be construed that I necessarily will be voting for the bill in the end. I, I think we ought to bring a bill and discuss it, uh, but I don't know exactly where it's gonna go. And I don't want somebody to say, well, you supported bringing the bill, now you don't support the bill. <laughs> so it's just a I think I've heard similar comments already today. <laughs> oh, <bet. laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill, do you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Briefly, I was going to say the same same thing as Representative McRae. So, okay. Are there any further discussion, questions, comments? Please call the roll. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, absent. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Unanimously passes of those on screen. All right, so we have an unanimous to report out a bill on the authority of municipalities to regulate timber harvesting. With that, I will close the briefing and discussion, and I'll turn to Karen to see what else we have before we are done. Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I do have a committee amendment and corresponding fiscal note for you. Um, I can share my screen here. Um, there it is. Um, so this is the committee amendment. Um, to an act requiring a contract for the administration of uh, Department of ACF low cost spaying and neutering, neutering program. 
Um, so, gosh, this has been so long. So the bill requires the commissioner to contract uh, for the administration of the uh, companion animal sterilization fund, um, but requires the department to administer the fund if a suitable uh, third party administrator can be found. Um, it also requires uh, the spaying or neutering of a feral cat uh, will be covered uh, regardless of a, a person's income. Um, uh, and then it requires the commissioner to develop procedures. Uh, I just said that to pay a person, regardless of income, 100% of the cost for spaying or neutering a feral cat. And then it just kind of lays out, um, you know, directing the commissioner to issue a request for proposals no later than August 1st of this year. And it kind of um, lays out the criteria for the administrator of. Um, the, the third party uh, administrator. And then um, it also provides for an evaluation of um, the initial three year contract. So this shouldn't, any of the, none of this should be new to you all. Um, and then we did get the fiscal note. Um, it's one of those, yes, there's a fiscal note required, but there's no dollar amount. Um, and it just says, um, that essentially the bill includes offsetting personal services and all, all other allocations. Um, I, I guess in a nutshell, the bottom line is that the department has indicated that the um, companion animal sterilization fund has sufficient resources available to accommodate um, the increase um, in uh, services. So that's that's the gist of the uh, fiscal note. Are there any questions? Questions for Karen? Nope. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess the, the last thing I don't didn't know there, so we had two committee bills or two other committee bills that the committee uh, voted to submit. One of them I think is uh, in pretty good shape for discussion. And I didn't know if Senator Dill and Representative Pluker were ready to talk about the, um, the I'll call it the LD558 um, committee bill, the one with the $100 million appropriation. Uh, sure. Um, Bill and I had uh, back and forth discussion. We actually had a Zoom call. And I think on that one, uh, we were pretty much 100% in agreement on how to proceed with it. It's $100 million. It's put together an advisory committee, seven members, at least for the beginning of the discussion. It may be more than that once we have the discussion on who should be on the advisory committee. The funding would uh, um, reside in the Department of Agriculture with the advisory committee overseeing it. This advisory committee would also be authorized to bring in any specialty groups that they may need if there's a specific issue um, that needs expertise uh, that they don't have within the advisory committee or they want to have some other expertise. Um, and uh, let's see, it. it goes through several things that they could include, but uh, may include, but they're not restricted to them. There was a list of things that we had uh, talked about. Um, let's see, what else is there? That's all I'm thinking of, Bill. Anything else you can think of? No, I mean, all right. We were looking to, you know, potentials. So we're, we're looking at, you know, so we also we included a lot of the information that came out of the report back from 558. Yeah. So specific areas of research that they wanted to look into, looking at long-term environmental um, reporting, I think, or monitoring. I think the thing that might have added talking to farmers um, was looking at health impacts and long-term health monitoring. Yep. Um, okay. um, family yep. And then the other thing, oh, and I think I don't know if this is explicitly stated in our wording, but like looking into 
uh, oh, it was explicitly saved. We had uh, like short term uh, income replacement for the farmers who aren't going to be able to make any money this coming year. Yep. Um, and then uh, maybe a long term, you know, exploring the idea of a buyback program. Um, so that kind yep. of thing. And Karen has it all right now, which we'll be able to send out to everybody before the hearing. Um, so I, I think that's probably pretty, pretty much what we had in that particular bill. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, Representative Hall. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, is there any thought or uh, been put into that on uh, testing food that comes in from uh, foreign countries? Like I know in the wintertime, you got like tomatoes and stuff coming out of Mexico and, and Brazil and whatnot. Um, is that going to be part of that or, or it, not? It's, it's not specifically said, but one of the things that we have in there, it says that the state can, it, some of this funds could be used for the state to set up one or more labs, even though I know there's like 3.2 million already set aside for labs. So um, not specifically though, Randy, but okay. I represent them all. Yeah. Thank you. The other, the other thing is, even though it's not a part of the bill, we, we discussed about sending a memo to a probes on where we as a committee may suggest that the 100,000 comes from. I talked to Senator Breen and she said that would be, you know, a very logical step because this is asking for 100 million essentially from the, the surplus funds. Um, but it seems that, of course, that's kind of all earmarks. So um, we would have to, uh, for, well, at least we can suggest where we think it might come from. So, and we can do that in, once, when we hear the bill or when we work the bill. So any other questions? Karen? So it sounds like the committee is comfortable with uh, moving. I, I have a copy of the amendment or the bill draft if you want to see it, but it sounds like um, with Senator Dill and Representative Pluker, whatever they agree to, and then obviously there's an opportunity to make further changes to it once it's heard and worked. And so it's not like it's going straight to the floor or anything. So I just want to make sure that I can go ahead and process this because um, my goal is to get it on the calendar for referral uh, March 9th. And I know that sounds like it's far away, but given that we have three other committee bills <laughs> that also need to get on that calendar, if we can get this one off, uh, off of the, uh, the deck, then that would be great. Okay. That's what I'll do then. Send it on its way. All right. What else? Um, so the only other um, question I have is the schedule uh, next week. I did um, need to know if the hemp uh, work session could be scheduled for next Thursday or should it just be the following week? Because I, I need to get Cheryl uh, a schedule by the end of today. Representative O'Neill. Oh, thanks. Um, I am waiting on, I had spoken with um, Gary Fish last week and I'm just waiting on a time to meet with um, meet with him about it. So I can't speak to that. Okay. Um, oh, I, yeah. I, I don't I know if you just want to okay. just schedule it for the, ne the week after that, just um, so we don't have to, you know, postpone the work session just to give you enough time. Um, because Cheryl does need to, she probably send it out today, given the weather tomorrow um, that they're calling for. So yes, we could just proceed that way and, and schedule it last minute on Thursday if, if, that, if you are ready. Do you want to schedule it on March 8th or do you want to go ahead with 3-3 like you just said? What do you uh, think, Representative? I think I think further out makes more sense just because I haven't heard back from folks, but I don't know. All right, why don't we schedule it for the 3 8? That's the following week. Okay, and, and we can always change that next week, but right, I, right. I just, I will not. Yeah, I thought we were going to talk about it during chair. So, I, yeah. Um, yeah, or we could do that too. I didn't yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Which would be next Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, that's all I have. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did you, we want to discuss the bill coming out of 264? 
Oh yeah, that's right. We got another PFAS bill. Do you have that put together? I do. I do. Although it, it sounded like um, there may not. Well, there's there's, there's I think ninety nine percent agreement on that one. It's just okay. one one sticking point, and my suggestion was just to leave it in there for discussion, and it can be taken out or go forward or whatever. I just thought it was easier to take it out than to try to put it back to put it in later. So. And I, and I thought Bill had agreed to just leave it and we'll discuss it, but I may be wrong on that. Uh, no, you, uh, it, things can be changed. I can I can share my screen if that's helpful. Sure. Okay. Um, so so this is the other uh, PFAS committee bill, but it's uh, much more specific. Um, and. Uh, so it would, the, the first section of the committee amendment, um, I, and just for other committee members other than Representative Pluker and Senator Dill, there's a dis ongoing discussion about how uh, PFAS should be uh, defined. Um, I think Senator Dill is interested in defining it as uh, organic chemicals, uh, fluorinated organic chemicals containing at least two uh, fully fluorinated carbon atoms. And Representative Pluker is uh, interested in just one fully fluorinated carbon atom. atom. And that's an important dis distinction for a couple of reasons. Um, and, but, I'm trying to, and I'm trying to get an organic chemistry lesson. So before, before we actually hear the bill. So <laughs> it's been a long time since I've had organic chemistry. So I got to figure that one out. I may be fine with the way, as Representative Plukers has said too. Yeah. Like, yep. Yeah. So but that, that agrees with the EPA definition. So um, in, in section two, I just repealed the current def definition of pesticide. And really um, the new definition of pesticide is you see in paragraph A and B, that's current law. And then what the only new element is adding any substance or mixture of substances intended to be used as a spray adjuvant. And then um, my legal reviewer said, what's a spray adjuvant? <laughs> so I, I uh, put that in the definition section as well. And again, this is not, I, I'm not a subject matter expert, but I got this from the report um, and the definition of spray adjuvant. So it amends you know, some definitions, which are key. And then, um, in section five of the bill, um, it basically says a person may not distribute in the state, um, paragraph H, a pesticide that has been contaminated by uh, PFAS or uh, a pesticide that contains intentionally added PFAS. So this paragraph's a little tricky uh, because there is a current law in uh, Title 38 uh, where DEP is going to be um, regulating products uh, with intentionally added PFAS. And um, so starting January, uh, I think 2023, there's a notification process, but then in January, uh, as of effective January 1st, 2030, um, there will be a prohibition. And Title 38, for purposes of that law, defines uh, PFAS as you know one fully fluorinated carbon atom. So that's why I, for purposes of this committee bill at this time, I put notwithstanding that because they that Title 38 has a different definition. So um, I think if that's the route the committee goes, then you may need a carve out in Title 38 um, because pesticides are a subset of products. So um, I'm, I don't, I think it would be, I don't think it's anyone's intent to regulate um, pesticides with one fully fluorinated carbon atom differently than pesticides with two fully fluorinated carbon atoms. So that's why I think there's a little more work around this one. And then um, section six, is uh, a person may not uh, use a fluorinated HDPE or 
a high density polyethylene container for storage, distribution, or packaging of pesticides. Um, so that's the gist of the committee bill with some areas still to be uh, worked out. I, th I think the only difference is, Karen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Pluker, I think on that last one you showed, we actually said all pesticide containers could be regulated by the Board of Pesticide, whether they're fluorinated or not. Because oh, okay. there, may, there, there may be other reasons for them to actually regulate a container. So we didn't keep that specific. We just said any pesticide container. But this is a prohibition on use of those fluorinated containers. True, then maybe it was just added to it but we did have it so that it was all pesticide containers under there. And maybe it needs to be up in the other section. But that was one of the recommendations that we had in the original um, presentation, I think. And we just combined it into one, so. And that was my understanding it was because uh, we don't, the science is still evolving around the storage containers and there we might end up needing to add in other kinds of plastic or it could be HDPE which is treated in certain ways is still okay, is okay. So, so we were just wanted to give BPC authorization the authority to regulate that as they saw as they saw fit because I, right. I think it's too too it's the the science is moving too fast right now for us to come up with a clear statute on it. Okay. Uh oh I'll let Representative O'Neill go. Yep, Representative O'Neill. Thanks. I just had a question and um, I, you might have said it and I just didn't process it. What, what definition of PFAS are we using? Are we using Maine's definition or a more limited one? You want to answer that, Senator Dill? Yeah, that's, the, that's, that's what's up for discussion. Is it one fluorinated carbon or two fluorinated carbons? Um, and, and I was... I am advocating that we use EPA's definition as far as pesticides are concerned. And that's what's in there. And as I said, we left it in there just for discussion purposes. And that's what she, that's what Karen said, notwithstanding section 38, so that we know that there's a discrepancy. And, you know, Representative Pluker and I had a discussion about certain carve outs for certain products, um, but we're, you know, my suggestion is we start out this way, and if we want specific carve outs or whatever it happens to be to make it flow, we can do that. Okay, thanks for explaining it again. Yeah, I guess this is, you know. That's, that's where I have to have my organic chemistry lesson, Representative <laughs> O'Neill, so I can. Uh, I want to stick with what we've done in all our other laws, I guess, but that's, yeah. that's what I want. Yeah. Representative Pluker. Yeah, I was essentially going to say that. It, I, the reason my thinking behind it is to maintain the same definition across main statute and not have different definitions in different places. Right. And I, and I don't want to not withstand the, what was 1503 in DP law that, um, because currently this, there is a law on the books, which would regulate these products, um, in years to come. And I, and I don't want that to, I don't want to not withstand that practice, but we're going to have this conversation in work session. So. Any other questions on this? So there. I have one. I, so assuming I get the container piece right, and I will work with you, Senator Dill and Representative Pluker on that, um, is the rest of the committee comfortable with assuming we get that sorted out, then I could get this on its way to revisor's office. So again, that we can get it on the calendar for March 9, and get it off the deck since we have two more after this to work on. Okay. I I see Representative O'Neill is smiling, so I'll take that as <laughs> yes. Slow reaction. <laughs> I know the only two that were saying thumbs up were Senator Dill and Representative Fluker, which is the ones that <laughs> so I wanted to hear what. As long as everyone else is comfortable with that, that's what I'll do. Okay. What else you have for us, Karen? Uh, that's it. Cheryl, anything? 
Can I have a motion to adjourn? It's been moved by Representative Plucas, seconded by Representative O'Neill. All in favor, none opposed. Thank you all. See you next week. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Hello. Have a good afternoon. I thought Jim was going to stick around, but I guess not. <laughs>